Good afternoon, besides Augusta. How's you, how y'all doing right now? Everybody got that Chick-fil-A kind of ah, after lunch feel? Yeah, that was my first Chick-fil-A sandwich. I've been in a different place in this world, so I couldn't go, but gonna have them. They were pretty damn good, pretty damn good. And we're thrilled that you're gonna be here with us for the next hour or so. Um, we do have some prizes to give away. We have four prizes for those of you that ask great questions and participate with us. Also, Griffin and I like doing things that are interactive. So uh, we need you, if you want to play along, get out your phone, get out your laptop. You're going to need the internet. Because the reality is that I could stand up in here and teach you about things on slides. I could talk to you about how you need to learn by taking training or doing other stuff. But that's not fun. What if we did things a little differently? That's what we're going to focus on in the next couple minutes. OK, so we start out with a challenge. This is an OSINT talk. We want to give you an OSINT challenge. What we're not going to give you is any help, any hints, any clues, any knowledge, or anything like that. So you may already possess what it takes to solve this challenge, and that's great. You may not, so you might have to go and see if you can figure it out. We're gonna give you 60 seconds to do it. In a second here, three words are gonna appear in that red box on the screen. There's a structure that correlates with a location that are related to those three words, okay? Those three words will take you to a place in the world if you know what to do, and at that place in the world, there's a structure. We want the name of that structure in 60 seconds. And when you, when you know that name of that structure, yell it out. The first two people to yell it out actually will get prizes. Now, of course, that means you don't actually have to do any of this. You just have to be the first one to copy what the first person says. And the second place person will absolutely be fine. You ready? Yes. Let's, let's do, do this. Here we go. 60 seconds starts now. Where is this location? Uh, yeah, that might be good. There's the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower. Oh, that, we got number one nice. and two. There we go. Excellent work. Oh, Here you go, sir. Better. Nice. And we've got some lock picks for you, young man. Here you go. Well done. Very, very good. 15 seconds. That's great. Now, for those of you that are wondering what the heck just happened, um, we're going to reveal this to you, but what we need you to do is think about, uh, I'll take this, this is fun. Okay. So think about your experience that just happened right there. Okay, when we told you that you. this was the challenge, you were going to have to work with these three words, I saw a whole bunch of people right away light up, grab their phone, grab their laptop, they knew what to do, okay? And then I saw a whole bunch of other people that are just looking at me like, what, three words? What does that mean? I don't understand. So did you know what to do instinctively? Right off the bat, did you have the knowledge already coming into the challenge in order to be able to be successful? How did that make you feel if you didn't? Okay, a lot of competitive people in this room, I'm assuming, right? We all like to compete and win. Did that motivate you or demotivate you that you felt like either you were adequate or inadequate in your knowledge? Did you learn anything or were you even able to learn anything in the 15 seconds that it took someone else to solve it who had the knowledge? Maybe not. Oh, it was true. That was the Eiffel Tower. And uh, how do I know? Because we made the slides. And I'll show you in just a moment, all right? Very good. So some of you had the knowledge and some of you did not. But for those of you that did not, could you have solved it if we gave you some hints? So I'm going to show you a couple of hints here. The first one would be the logo up on the screen, those slashes inside that red box, is a logo that you would have needed to know how to solve this challenge if you didn't already know. Some of you are probably thinking right now, okay, I can take that logo, I can go work with it, I know what to do. Here's another hint. If the three slashes aren't familiar, maybe a site like symbols.com can tell you what they mean. So now another group of you all of a sudden leveled up and said, you know what, I think I can figure it out from here. To find the correct location, the correct geographic location, you have to be precise with your spelling. So those exact three words, exactly how we spelled them, would have led you to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France. If you know that a site called What Three Words has mapped out the world in three meter squares, and each one of those three meter squares has an individual con uh, uh, connection between three specific words in a certain order, they don't repeat anywhere else, 
And you can use those three words to lead somebody to a three meter spot anywhere in the world. Congratulations. You just completed a learning capture the flag experience. And that's our talk, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Please stand. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very good. OK, so and the point is some of you also gained some knowledge because not everybody in the room knew right off the bat that they were going to be able to solve that challenge. But now every one of you knows how to do that or at least where to look. So a little bit about us. My name is Griffin. Uh, online, I go by Hatless Wonder. If you're involved in the online OSINT community, um, I, I do a couple of different things. I work with Micah in the My OSINT training site. Uh, we gave a talk, uh, training rather, two-day training this week on o open source intelligence. Uh, we also both are co-founders of the OSINT Games Capture the Flag platform, uh, which we're going to tell you about here in a second. I also uh, am the Director of Intelligence for the National Child Protection Task Force. And that's uh, a US-based but international working nonprofit, uh, heavily comprised of law enforcement, prosecutors, and now uh, tech professionals that combine their skills in order to uh, work on cases of missing, exploited, and trafficked children around the world. So we take the skills that we're going to talk about learning in this talk today, and somebody like myself or the people on my team put them to work to help find predators uh, or victims of crimes against children. And I have a history in cybersecurity. I grew up doing B-sides up in the Washington, D.C. area all around. Um, and I love cybersecurity and, and the InfoSec community. I've been around for a while. Uh, I wrote a SANS class on open source intelligence. I taught web app pen testing. And I really found myself gravitating more towards open source intelligence or stalking people, uh, researching people online. And when I was doing that, I was like, you know, we can teach this. We can help people learn how to do this. Because the techniques, unlike many of the cyber techniques where you might need an advanced degree in what the heck 802.16 is and how it propagates through metal versus wood, in OSINT, it's looking at social media. It's looking at things that you and I do every day. And so what I did was I created the MyOSYNC training company, the OSYNC games company, and uh, Griffin has helped me out with some of those things. But let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to be able to get out of this talk. First off, we're going to be talking about what is OSYNC a little bit deeper, because I know that this is InfoSec, and I know that many of you probably already use OSINT in your work, whether you're offensive, defensive, or somebody else that's not even in cyber. You're doing open source intelligence. You just don't know it yet. Also, we're going to be talking about gamification. How do you make learning fun? Who here has ever sat in a class and you're like, I can't wait for this thing to, uh, to end? What the heck is this guy talking about? Or, oh, I could teach this. Yeah, that's not fun. That's not a way to learn. That's a way to go to sleep. And that's not what we're here to show you. We're here to show you that learning can be fun. All you need to do is find the places to do it. Also, through the years of teaching either SANS classes or other classes, Griffin and I figured out that people learn in different ways. <gasps> I know, right? It's weird. But you know if you're a visual learner or a person that likes to do things with your hands, like assemble badges. And what we're going to do is we're going to help point you at those types of online challenges that might be right for you. All right? And we'll show you where these challenges are. OK, so another challenge. Oh, sorry, that's my That's, yeah, that's okay. your cue. Yeah. We'll get this figured out. <laughs> we'll get this figured out. <clears throat> OK, so in the rest of the slides throughout this deck, we've hidden three words. OK, they correlate to a monument. Now all of you should know what that means. If you see a word that has red text and those three slashes in front of it, they might not always be obvious, but that's going to be one of the three words that are clues that will lead you to the, the location. By the way, that's not one of the words, OK? <laughs> Obviously, we've experienced this before. They are not in the correct order. So you're going to get three words, and you have to try some combinations, figure out what the correct order is. And when you get that, go ahead and tweet it to us with that hashtag, OSINT Games Augusta. And the winner, whoever tweets to us first, we will reply to your tweet and say, great job. So big, <laughs> big money on the line. <laughs> now, the reality is, is that you know, we're talking about OSINT here at a cyber conference, an InfoSec conference. But like I said, the world of open source intelligence, or OSINT, is one that you've been in for probably decades, and you didn't even know it. Um, many of you use the same skills 
to find things, to research people, to research products, to look up who's doing what. And what we do, like Griffin said, is we find people. And we do that with a certain goal in mind. Hey, this person is exploiting other people. Let's find where they live, where they work, what they do. Oh, this attacker is hacking somebody. Let's research that domain that their, their, uh, their information calls back to. Uh, so there's lots of ways that we actually use um, OSINT skills in the world of cyber. And really, I mean, as an offensive security person, I used to do, I used to love doing recon on my targets. And, re, and when I did, I was amazed at what I found. One of part of our process before we'd hack a website for a customer is we would Google the name of the website. And when we Google the name of the website, you never knew what came back. But if you Googled properly, you could find some really cool stuff. Like one time I found this, this help document. Who here reads help documents? Yeah. Oh, look at you all reading the manual. Yeah, yeah, the funny manual. Um, yeah, so you read the help document. And I'm reading the help document, and my buddies are telling me, hey, Micah, we need to be scanning this host. We need to be exploiting. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa there, cowboy. Let's just read the manual. So I read the manual. Sure enough, on like page three, it said, if you want to log in, to the application that we were testing, enter a username like this and a password like that. So I went and I entered that username, entered that password, and I was in. And my buddies were like, what exploit did you use? I'm like, Google. So there's a lot of power in these tools. We are sharing so much data intentionally and unintentionally on the internet. Those of us that know how to actually find that are quite successful in our work. Now, as I mentioned, you probably have done some Googling or some mapping to get here, right? How do you find out where to park? How do you find out where this location is? Pictures of Mark Baggett looking like a boss. I mean, these are things that people are looking for, and they correlate to OSINT skills. <laughs> I was looking to see if anybody would take a picture of that. No, please don't. Please don't. <laughs> It is, it is being yes. tweeted to bag it, probably, yes. OK, so let's talk about gamification, the science of gamification. You probably uh, experience gamification all throughout your lives in different ways. And we want to talk about gamification as it relates to learning. Now, there's a number of different reasons why it makes learning experiences better. How many people in here, uh, as part of their job, are tasked with training other people? A lot of hands, right? So the traditional way of training people is you prepare your materials, maybe you get some walkthroughs, you put everything together in a logical order, you uh, lay it all out in slides, and you go and you present the material, okay? And that's fine for some people, and they can learn that way, and they can see it, and depending on your presentation, they might be able to absorb that. But other people just don't quite learn that way, okay? Uh, some other people might need a little bit more hands-on, or they might need a little bit more mental motivation. Maybe they need some... Uh, type of reward or uh, you know the motivation of achievement or things like that. Gamification brings that into your teaching. So if you teach, I would encourage you to think about how to gamify your learning. We just taught all of you how to find what three words and use that to make a location. That was fun, right? Okay, better than us showing a slide that has a what three words website on it and telling you what it is. It was a challenge, okay? And everybody had that experience together. And when you incorporate gamification into your teaching style, or if you know that it's part of a learning style that helps you learn and you look for resources that give that to you, you're resilient to failure. Because failure in a gamified setting doesn't feel as finite as failure in your day job, right? It doesn't feel as, as, as finite as I just got out of that training class and walked back over to my desk and I couldn't do the thing that I was just supposed to learn. Okay, gamification helps you fail forward. Games can create an emotional connection. I'm going to show you an image here, and I want to know how many people have an emotional connection to this image. A lot, a lot of people in the world, right? It's Candy Crush. A lot of people have an emotional connection to that game. They have to get in there. They have to play it. They have to have the daily achievements. Okay, Gamification hooks people in. It makes it fun and entertaining. Something like this takes advantage of it and becomes a worldwide sensation. Okay. Think about the psych uh, psychological aspects of gamification and how tangible it can make the learning for you. But then think about your kids. How many people in here have children? 
okay? How many of your children have a tablet or a device with games, okay? Right. And the kids love those things. If they're like my kid, my four-year-old would literally starve to death if I gave him a tablet that was plugged in and just walked away, okay? He wants to do nothing but play those games. And he's learning. I mean, they learn colors, they learn shapes, they learn how to do things because that, that learning is gamified. It's fun, okay? Who would have thought that learning could be fun? Also, from many, many years of being in the cyber world, I know that there's lots of different types of ways to learn, right? We have Capture the Flags that I've played at DerbyCon, if you remember DerbyCon, at DEF CON, at other places, and I have almost not showered for three days as I've been intensely focused on getting the most points in a certain game. But I know that not everybody learns that way, and that's really not motivated. Some people, if you have a crisis situation or you have one hour or 60 seconds to do something, people rise to the occasion, especially if they're bringing their existing knowledge to bear. If you know about what three words, and we say we're going to give you three words that represent a geographic location, you are going to be able to better perform the task that we're going to give you. And so what we find is that some of the educational experiences, some of those capture the flags that are out there, the people that are performing best are the ones that are already qualified to do those tasks. The people that like to take their time, like to make their notes, like to go over their forms and processes, those people are learning but are not necessarily going to be as successful on some kind of scoreboard. Also pressure. I've seen situations, uh, so before cyber, I was in medicine for a little bit, and I've seen people just crumble under the pressure of a very stressful life and death situation. And I've seen other people that just hop in and know exactly what to do. Also, some of you probably do really well if you can just kind of relax. You light your lavender candle, you have your hacking glow lights on in the background, right? You set the mood. Now you're ready to go. You got your tic tac. Yeah, I mean, these types of situations can be tailored. These learning experiences can be tailored. Whether you love to compete, show your name on a scoreboard, get the high score, get a perfect score, get that recognition, or whether you're a solo performer. Everybody should be able to learn the way that they want. And imagine how, how discouraging it would be if you are new to a field, new to a topic, and we're like, hey, look, all these people have already gotten perfect scores, and it only took them like two hours, and you get to question one, and you're like, I have no idea what even a what three words is. A little discouraging there. Would that make you want to continue learning? Maybe for some of you. Most of you, maybe not. Also, some people like working as a team. Some people need to play as a team, and other people are more of those lone performers. Either way is absolutely fine, and there are certain situations where one might be more beneficial to the other. Working as a team can be great because you can parse out things. Hey, you cover this, you cover this, you cover this. I'm gonna focus on that, and then we'll all come together and we'll win the challenge. Versus you being responsible for everything. I know a lot of people that love being responsible for everything because they know that they can count on themselves. They know that they're not going to take that two hour break after lunch because they're tired and the team will suffer. So competition can be good. Also, there are a lot of resources out there. In cybersecurity, there are a bazillion capture the flags that are free. It, people just giving it away. There are also some that maybe have some type of donation associated with them or some other uh, monetary type of investment. In the OSINT world, same thing. We've got free ones out there. We've got paid ones. And, and really, you, there's, a, there's a great mix. You can choose which one works for you. Okay, so we're going to talk about are there any OSINT-focused games, okay? Some of you may be using OSINT in your job right now, in your daily lives. Some of you may be interested in OSINT, maybe like Micah, and they want to make the jump into just doing that full time. Uh, it's one of those things that just catches certain people. It's fun, right? It's, if you have the bug, you have the bug. And if you're one of those people, like Micah and myself, who really, really love open source intelligence, or you want to learn and you're fascinated, we've got some resources for you. 
I have a Start Me page that I'm a bit of an information hoarder, okay? I love knowledge. I love to read people's blogs. I love reading articles. I like watching videos. I like being in communities where I can learn from other people. That's fun for me, but it gets a little bit overwhelming, okay? So a long time ago, I created a Start Me page, and I used it to organize my own thoughts. I have a section on my favorite blogs. I have a section on my favorite open source intelligence tool sets. There's like 50 different places in there, just in the tool set section, and each one of them might have 2,000, 3,000 different tools categorized based on what you're trying to do in OSINT, okay? I don't have to think about where my resources are now. I can go to one place. And for those of you that are not familiar with what a Start Me is, it's just a bookmark page of URLs. These icons up here represent a website. So each of those websites may have different types of challenge content on it. In the OSINT world, lots of people love sharing their URLs, their bookmarks via these Start Me pages. Yeah, great. So let's talk through some of the discriminating factors for how you can actually choose the best CTF for you or the best learning challenge, hands-on learning challenge. In OSINT, we're gonna focus specifically. The first one is one, one shots. I don't know if any of you look at Twitter and you see somebody posting a picture, hey, I'm on vacation and here's a picture out my window. I bet nobody can figure out where I am. Okay, those are one shots. You figure it out, you're done. And sometimes those one shots uh, help you learn something or practice a skill. They're very low stress. You work on it by yourself or you can work on it as a team, but you do it in your own time. If you, there's no like limit on when you need to submit your response. Also, there's no cost involved, so very low barrier to entry. The bad part is you got to wait for the next one to uh, the next post or the next time somebody put, uh, sends one of these out. There are some people out there that work and put these type of open source intelligence quizzes out every single day, and it's at hashtag or not hashtag at quiz time on Twitter. There are different people, and the cool thing is is that they give you different. Uh, targets, different subjects. Sometimes it'll, they'll say, hey, I'm on a train right now, and they show you a picture. They don't tell you anything about it. There's no words, and they're like, what train is, am I on, and what is three stops from here? What is the name of that town? And you're like, I don't even know what part of the world you're in, but you work on it. Or you read the Twitter replies, and you see how other people are solving this, and you get smarter. Okay. So this next format is the learning CTF. And this is the one that's specifically designed to allow you to progress your learning along the way. Maybe not necessarily just test your skills, okay? Uh, in this case, we're highlighting the OSINT Dojo. And OSINT Dojo is an amazing uh, resource, uh, kind of an ecosystem now, created by a, a friend of ours named Sinwindy online. And the OSINT Dojo allows you to not only go and learn and uh, challenge your skills, it also allows you to participate in the community. So they have a rank system within the OSINT Dojo where you can achieve higher ranks by completing different things. And that can be giving a talk, writing a blog post, getting involved in a community. So it really helps to build that sense of community. And at the same time, they also release challenges. Uh, they also release videos and things like that designed to help you learn. And this specific one that's on the slide is from the Try Hack Me site, which some of you probably have been to. Free site, you go there, Sin Windy has created these challenges, you go answer the questions, have some fun, learn some things. The best part about it is, like Griffin said, this is about learning, so there are hints in there and other things to help you learn and grow. Anybody ever play GeoGuessr here? Yeah, this is one of my favorite, favorite things. GeoGuessr, for those of you that don't know it, we're going to see a little example of it later on. But essentially, this is a website that's made a game out of Google Street View imagery. You ever go to Google Street View and you're like, hey, let me see what's in this area? Well, with GeoGuessr, the idea is, is that they put you down in a certain town, city, part of the world, and you have to figure out, based upon what you see around you, where you are. Sometimes you have to get it right to the country level, sometimes to the city level, sometimes to the meter. And it's actually kind of fun. The best part about it is the variety of games. You like competing, they've got Battle Royale where you're going to go up against the people on the other side of the world that have nothing else to do but play GeoGuessr 24-7 and beat your butt. And it's fun. 
Sometimes. If you're somebody like me that doesn't like to compete because you don't like some 12 year old on the other side of the world beating your butt, then they have a co-op mode that you can play with your kids. My kids are a little bit older than Griffin's and are in college. And so, you know, on Friday nights or Saturday nights when things are going slow, they want some time off, they'll say, hey dad, you want to play GeoGuessr? And we could play together and figure out where in the world we are. In fact, we, we shifted from watching the Great British Bake Off once it, it finished its season last year. From doing that on Friday nights, we started playing GeoGuessr. And you'd be amazed at the other skills that your kids and you pick up. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. Okay. Now we have CTFs with missions. Okay. Has anybody in here ever participated in a Trace Lab CTF? Just a couple of people. Okay. So what Trace Labs has done is they created an entire organization around kind of gamifying the research of missing persons cases around the world. So what they do is periodically, uh, maybe once a month or every couple of months, depending on how things are going, they will hold an event and it's got a static amount of time. It'll be, you know, five, six hours on a Sunday afternoon. And you can participate alone or in teams. And what you do is you sign up and they give you at the beginning of the CTF event the targets. There might be four, five, six different actual real missing persons cases from anywhere in the world and you get to start with whatever's available on that missing persons case. And you go out with yourself or with your team and you gather up as much open source intelligence as you can that might generate leads about that person's whereabouts and you submit it. And they have a point system, a scoring system, and you can achieve, you can win a black badge, like we're all accustomed to in other types of CTF challenges. But more importantly, you're contributing to something big, okay? I was a volunteer for them a couple of years ago working on the reporting team in the background, and after those events, myself and a handful of other people took those tips, compiled reports, and sent them off to the law enforcement agent that's in charge of that missing person case. And we helped generate those leads, CTFs with a mission. Not only that, but you see on the slide, there's the at myosin training short URL. That's just a short URL thing like bit.ly or owly or whatever, because we save you time typing in the long URLs there. Um, here's another one. And this is actually really deep type of challenges that, that require you to invest a significant amount of your time learning, exploring, figuring stuff out. Um, this is one from Sector035, who's a person over in Europe. And what he does is he makes these simple, uh, these simple challenges. You just send an email off to a certain email address and what will happen is you'll get a reply back. That'll start you on your journey. Then it'll tell you to do something. When you do something, you have to then submit it. It will give you something else back. And so each time you solve a challenge, it'll give you your next mission. It's actually kind of cool. And I know people that spend literally the entire year working through these really, really hard challenges. It's free. You can do it however long you want. And you, you, there's actually a lot of learning and growth that happens as well. OK, and just for you, because you're our favorite audience this week, as Michael likes to say, we second, have a short. Second favorite. Second, second favorite. Oh, right. class Sorry, if first, you took our training class earlier this week, you guys are our favorite people. These are the second favorite. Second favorite. You guys are a very close second. We created a very short example CTF with a handful of challenges in it. Short URL uh, or a QR code up there. That'll be up for probably a long time. But no pressure, right? The stress factor is really low. You're not competing against anybody. You can work it alone. It's free. It's just an example and an opportunity for you to come and try out a couple of challenges of your own. Yeah, if you've never done an open source intelligence CTF or any CTF, Sometimes that first step, that first barrier of, oh my gosh, uh, other people are going to see what I'm posting. Oh, oh my gosh, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. We wanted to remove all that. So all this is is a Google form and there's things that you submit to it. Things that cybersecurity people would probably have a, a pretty good handle on. And if not, well, we've got some hints. Just submit the, your, your answers and you'll learn exactly what, uh, what to do. Okay. The idea is that OSINT learning and Hands-on learning in general is, a, is an opportunity for you to choose your own adventure, right? You set the pace. You choose what you do. And some of the, the offerings are absolutely incredible. And when you match how you learn with what is out there, you can do some amazing things. You also get out of it what you put in. This sounds kind of simple, but the reality is, is a lot of people, they will not 
they will, they will not try very hard. Uh, we have people that have done some of our CTFs that get in there and all they're doing is they're brute forcing the answers. We say something like the middle name of this person is six letters and they're like A, 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 B, 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 C, and they're just brute forcing it. They're not even trying to go answer the challenge. So if that's what you're doing, fine, but you're not actually learning from the engagement. Also, try multiple platforms, because what you'll find is that the way that Griffin and I create CTFs might be perfect for the way that you work, but you also might find that SinWindy or Sector035 or the people at Hactoria actually have something that's more engaging or fits you the way that you like to do things with your team, and you can, uh, you can go ahead and do a CTF with your team. If you are concerned about being embarrassed about your low score or how slowly you're doing things on the scoreboard, most of these CTFs allow you to create a pseudonym, a name, and if they require you to register with an email, go and create a CTF email for you to use in these things that doesn't have your name in it. So I might create, you know, John Doe 11385 at hotmail.com. And that's what I'm using to register these. So nothing's going to come back to Michael Hoffman. So if I screw up in one of these CTFs, so what? It doesn't matter. What Griffin and I have found also is that the more you do this with friends, the more you sit at a table like, all right, we're all going to do this CTF. What did you get? Oh, the more you work on that, the, be the faster you actually learn. Yeah, you'll get through the CTF better, but you're tapping into the people around you's skills, experiences, and knowledge, and you'll actually do, uh, do some faster learning. The first step is always the hardest one. And so all we ask you to do is give it a try. That example CTF, nobody sees the results except for Griffin and I. So if you've never done a capture the flag, give it a try. That You have absolutely nothing to lose. The other thing that you should think about is if you are working in some job, cyber, OSINT, whatever, and you have to learn things on the job, if you mess up, then guess what? The database might get corrupted, or some hacker might get past your Yara rules or whatever. I think I used that properly. Um, or you know, other things might happen that are bad. In these CTFs, the idea is, is that you're training in a safe environment. You mess up, nothing happens. You maybe get a little bit of deduction on your points. And that can be really, really helpful to just allow you to continue to learn. And you decide, you want to learn or compete. This is from uh, GeoGuessr. I've played literally hundreds, if not thousands, probably hundreds of hours of GeoGuessr, um, something I am proud of. And I can tell you this, there's sometimes I want to get the perfect 25,000 point value for five rounds of GeoGuessr. And so I will work literally for hours trying to find out what this shape of somebody's mailbox in Sweden looks like and what street it can be found on. Because I want to be that precise. Other times I'm like, yeah, it's close enough to this. Oh, look, I got over 20,000 points. You're not always going to want to compete. Sometimes you just want to play, and that's OK. I gave a talk back in 2017, 2018 on imposter syndrome. A big mental health issue for a lot of people in cybersecurity and in other places as well. And I talked about one of the ways to defeat or to tamp down some of those feelings that I have about imposter syndrome are to track my progress. Learn a little bit each day. See how fast you can do things. See how much better you are than before. And so when you're doing GeoGuessr, track your scores. Track how fast it took you to find things. Oh, I'm really good over in Israel because they have Hebrew on all their signs. Um, I'm really good over there, but I need to work over here, and I can note my own progress. So now we're not just learning. We're working on our mental health and really helping ourselves get better. OK. So there's a bunch of other intangible benefits that comes with solving these challenges, and Micah has talked about some of these things. But they can bleed over into other parts of your life. Your approach to this type of learning, or maybe your approach to developing this type of learning for your own team, can help people build other skills. The organizational skills, how they keep track of the information, how they document it, their attention to detail, all of that stuff matters when you're solving a challenge. And like we've talked about already, it might matter because you compete against yourself. It might matter because you're in front of a team and everybody can see what you're doing. It might matter because you are results driven and you have to have the top score. 
All of that's fine. But the idea is that it's motivating those skills to come out, okay? It keeps you on task, it helps you learn, and it helps you get better. So let's talk about this. Let me walk through a little example of how this might work. And this here we're going to be working on persistence and determination because I know when you are doing your cyber threat intelligence and you're trying to find out who's behind this IP address that's sending the whatever towards our systems or when you're looking at, hey, who's actually going to be hired for our company? I want to learn about them and their skills and where they're coming from. You are actually going through more than just a cursory look at the data that's out there. This is from GeoGuessr. Um, that, that Google uh, Street View based game. And sometimes in GeoGuessr, you get put into a city. And you can just, you can literally scroll around and you can see like phone numbers and license plates and signs that say Micah's hot dog joint. And you go to Google and you type in Micah's hot dog joint and there's only one in the entire world and you know exactly where you are. And other times you're on a dirt road out in the middle of who knows where. But the cool thing about GeoGuessr is that you can turn around and see that the road continues the other direction and there's nothing to go on. But you know what? By playing this game, by realizing that I want to learn, I start going down the road. And for this exercise, I will just let you know, I actually got like tendonitis in my elbow because it was, it was kilometers of just clicking and clicking and clicking. This is what I do for you all. You see this? hurting myself. Um, and so sometimes you see signs. Now signs in GeoGuessr are awesome because there's language, there's shape, there's color. There's even things like how, it's, how the sign is strapped to the pole. There are websites out there like GeoHints and GeoTips where you can actually look up, hey, for a sign with these two straps on the back, that's probably over in Hungary versus Chile. It's amazing. So you look at the sign, you're like, um, OK, I, I can't make that out. So you get a little bit sad, right? But you keep working and you keep going down that road. And another 15 minutes go by and I finally find this and I'm like, yes, people. And I've got hogs and horses. Now I know nothing about hogs, horses, foliage, nothing like that. So if I did know that that was a certain type of hog that is only raised in a certain part of the world, I would be golden. But this is just extra data. And I don't know that. What I can do is look at the people. I can look at the color of their skin. I can look at their clothing. I can look at other things like, hey, are they smoking cigarettes? Are they holding things? What color are their clothing? And then I note those in my I put that in my notes. Just like if you're doing a pen test, you're recording all the services that a system has open, and then you'll come back to it. You never know what you're going to need. So I note these things down, and I go down the road. And you know what? After about a half hour of going down this road, just clicking, you start seeing the matrix. Like, you see there's water, there's like mud on the road there in the center, tire tracks. Is this in the desert part of the world? Nope. We also see certain vegetation up there, lush vegetation. I mean, there's probably a lot of water. Okay, you know, that, that's something. Um, we can, we can kind of make those assumptions in our heads. And then, and then you see a sign with words. And you hear the angels singing. And, and you're like, yes, finally. It's, it says uh, Territorio. Um, all right, well, I'm not exactly sure what that means. But I go to Google Translate, and I translate it. I'm like, OK, I'm getting some things. Now maybe we're in a certain place. Also, there's standing water on that road means they're probably getting more water than they, can, than they can use. All right, so maybe rainforest. If I translate this with Google Lens on my mobile or on a device, it says territory with community property, Kanita law. All right, but we also see the language. The language where the number three is is Quechua. I don't know what that is. Maybe some of you do, but I Google it. And what happens is it comes up and says South African people of Peru, parts of Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, and Ecuador. Now I've localized it. There are six continents I don't care about right now, just focusing on one. And we put that in our bag, and then we keep going down the road, and we see these people wearing very traditional, very common clothing of people in that area of the world. So now I have confirmation. And I'm still persistent. So 15 minutes later, I'm going down the road even further, and I see another sign. And I'm like, yes. 
I can kind of make out that word. And this is the problem with Google is that how many times do you're like, oh, uh, I'll just take that phone number off the building and it blurs it out, redacts it. Here it's just low resolution, but I, I think that says Tartagal. And when you search on Tartagal, you find out that it's in Argentina. And then when you look in Argentina and where Tartagal is, is it near Bolivia? Is it near Chile? Yes, which really meshes with that Quechua language, right? All right, so now we start looking at roads that are going the same direction that we were going on that on GeoGuessr. And when we find a road going northeast and southwest that is in Tartagal or near Tartagal, we can pick a place on that road. And when I put that, that number two down there, part of me was like, oh, you put it down in the wrong place. You were 12 kilometers off. But in the entire world, I was 12 kilometers away from this random picture in some part of the world I've never been to. I chalk that up as a win, even though I only got 4,852 points. Because sometimes it's the experience you get when playing that's more important than that 12 kilometer result. I know if I persist in my work, I know if I persist in my learning, I'll get to that end result eventually. Then I can put the ice packs on my arms. Okay. So of course it's not all about winning, right? But some people, the motivated by winning people don't have fun unless they win or have a chance to win, and that's okay. I throw this in here as a little bit of a jab because obviously we are the type of people that try to err on the side of letting people have the learning experience without the pressure of competition, but that's not for everyone. And that's our talk, ladies and gentlemen. You might have noticed two out of the three slashes uh, have appeared in, the, in this talk. Uh, there's another one maybe, oh wait, do we? All three of them were there. And there you go. Well done. So if you know, does anybody know where that location is? Yes. Dang. You. The World Peace Monument. Sir, we have Very good. either a war collar dope scope for you, so you can look weird while you're doing stuff, or you have a coffee cup. You take the first one. There you go. Cool. Um, this is our information up here. Uh, this is the, a link to the CTF. Does anybody have any questions for Griffin or I? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so the question okay. is well, we got, we, in the OSINT world, what do you get? What do you, you do if it? you are looking yeah. up a well, person a and they don't have a lot of Good information job. online? They're almost a ghost. So in the OSINT world, what we do is we look for that person, any identifiers. Can't find it. What we do is we know that sometimes the weakest links are the people around them. So I'm going to branch out to if it's in scope for my investigation. And that's the thing is that Griffin and I do investigations. We're not randomly stalking people. Nice We're not looking up people just to look into their lives. We're doing it with a purpose. So if my purpose is finding this person because they're in jeopardy or they've gone missing, I'm going to look at their friends. I'm going to look at their family members because invariably there's going to be some family member taking a picture with my target, even though my target doesn't have a Facebook account. So I'll switch to them. Other questions about open source intelligence or training or CTFs? Sir. How do you avoid winning yourself? How do you avoid what? How do you avoid getting yourself in trouble? I'm thinking that you probably mean, <laughs> can you tell me more about what you mean? Okay, so uh, the question is, is how do you keep yourself safe when you might need to visit sites that has content that's not maybe legal or ethical for you to download? Would that be right? Griffin, go ahead and take this one. Sure, so, <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> how long can I stop? We got time. Um, so I work in the world of uh, crimes against children, including um, child sexual exploitation material and things of that nature. Uh, there are certain subsets of people with the legal authority to be able to um, handle and process that imagery. There's also, I mean, we could spend the rest of the day talking about everything that runs alongside that from mental health to systems protection and everything else. Uh, what I will say is when it comes to open source intelligence strictly, know your legal boundaries, know your company policy boundaries because those will oftentimes be more stringent than your legal boundaries. Um, and also know the ethics uh, of what you're going to do. Uh, ethics is something that is, uh, there is no black and white ethical line. 
Um, there's a lot of things that are hotly debated. You know, is it, uh, is it open source intelligence if I go password knock your account on Facebook so I can get a partially redacted version of your email address so that I can corroborate it with something else? And then I know that your phone number is the same as those last two digits that I saw. So, you know, so there's, there's gray areas in that regard. When it comes to legality and it comes to the material that you're, I think that you're asking about, there's no gray area. Okay. If you're not authorized and you're not in law enforcement, you don't go to those places. You don't do those things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there are safe. So one of the other things that Griffin and I do, much like many of you, that maybe uh, malware hunters or incident responders that have to investigate some site that is some callback or or hosting malware that your users might be going to. There are ways of visiting websites pulling down data without pulling sensitive content like malicious documents or even images. I don't know if any of you are from the past like I am, but I used to browse the internet using links, which is a terminal based. Yeah, we laugh about it, but think about it. If you have sensitive content like kids being exploited, and that's absolutely legal for you to even see or put on your computer in your web browser's cache, don't even bring it down. Use a text-based web browser to get the text, but not the images. If there's other things that are illegal um, that, you, that I, we didn't cover, just talk to Griffin afterwards. Yes, sir. So when you're dealing with finding an individual, have you ever run into synthetic personas? And if so, how easy are, they, uh, how easy and what are the best ways to pop those? <sighs> so, oh, I can do this. You want me to do it? Yeah. So, so the question is about synthetic personas, which some of you might know as sock puppets, some of you might know them as research accounts or alternative identities. And they're these, these uh, false personas. They're people on social media that aren't really real people. People are using them to put distance between their real accounts and whatever it is they're looking for. So if I want to gain access to some organization, I might on Facebook get a very attractive young woman's picture and make a very attractive, uh, maybe a young person's LinkedIn saying, hey, I just graduated with a cybersecurity degree in this place. I'm studying for my A plus and I'm really looking to get into cybersecurity and start connecting her to different places. That's more cat phishing. That's the operationalizing of that, of that sock puppet account. But how do we figure this out? Well, we verify and validate. That's, that's the first thing. You look at that profile, and Griffin has done this uh, two billion times, taking scammer information from Reddit um, and other things. You, you research those phone numbers, or those emails, those pictures. Is that picture reused somewhere else? Is it a model on some stock photo site? Yeah. Um, and if you're interested in learning how to do that, Myosync Training has a class <laughs> on a... Uh, yes, good one. Yeah, so the, the, people that, um, the people that are very careful and have great operational security and hide all of their details and stuff, that can be very time consuming and maybe require some level of engagement to uncover. Uh, the folks that are doing this at scale, the shotgun approach, you know, uh, a scam website that goes up for 48 hours until it gets knocked down and stuff, those people are recycling elements because they don't have the luxury of time, right? They're recycling imagery, they're recycling text from other places. You can find, uh, you know, you could find that text being repeated on the next scam website as soon as they send it up, or uh, you know, maybe you find it referenced in prior research material. And like, there's things that you can do to exploit those. Unfortunately, the really good one-on-one -on -one actors that only have their own time to to deal with, that can, like I said, that can require engagement. Yeah, you break apart that. What's, What's that? that? Phishing versus whaling. Phishing versus whaling, right? If somebody takes the time to put in, make a really good persona, you're not going to be able to discern the difference. I mean, the personas yeah. that we use in our work, you'll never be able to see them. We're already connected to all of you. Hashtag besides Augusta. Yes, sir. The question is, what's the best way to create your own sock puppet? Sir, so we're going to defer that because we teach classes that take 45 minutes to just teach part of that. So um, there are training courses out there that can help you create those. Uh, and the idea with sock puppets, good people use them because I don't want to go on Facebook looking you up and you see, hey, look, Micah Hoffman, OSINT person, is looking me up. That might spook you or otherwise. So we create sock puppet accounts legitimately, not legally, but legitimately, and we, um, we use those instead of using our own. But uh, there are courses out there that, that can help you out with that. Other questions?
Cool. Um, well, thank you all for coming and for staying awake. We really appreciate it.